Good evening. Welcome to uh, my podcast. I'm going to try something a little new tonight. We're going to try to do a video and audio uh, podcast. So I hope you enjoy uh, the presentation. We're continuing in our study to, in 2 Samuel. Tonight we're in chapters 4 and 5. So if you have your Bibles, if you turn there with me. And uh, we'll open the Word of God and begin studying here in just a few moments. There's a beautiful uh, Southern Gospel song called Champion of Love. Brother Dave has sung this song several times at church. But I'd like to call your attention to the lyrics because they reflect King David's godly character as he maneuvers through the difficult situation he finds himself in in his journey to become king over all of Israel. His attitude is so reflective of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if we get anything out of this lesson, I, I think that's the uh, main point that we need to get, is that whatever we do, wherever we go, we need to do what's right all the time, regardless of what our situation is. We need to reflect the character of God in every aspect of life. But listen to the lyrics of this song, Champion of Love. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention. I want to introduce to you, in this corner, the good and the right. Stands a champion, robed in white. His height exceeds the heavens. His weight overweighs the world. He reaches, reaches everywhere. His age is evermore. He is higher than the higher, highest, greater than the great. No one will ever take his crown away. He's more mighty than the mightiest. He reigns from above. He's the all-time undisputed, undefeated champion of love. He left his hometown to enter this arena to raise his hand in victory for me. An angry crowd crucified this king who wore the crown as they gladly watched the champion going down. Oh, but I will never count him out, for I am a witness of the day he rose to reclaim the title Champion of Love. And as we read through chapter 4 and 5, David has some ups and downs. But as he keeps his focus on God, he holds true uh, to the promise that God had made him, that one day he's going to be king. He holds on to that promise, and one day God does make him king of all Israel. As we come to chapter 4, after Abner's death, David could have uh, easily exerted himself and forced Israel to accept him as king. But David, uh, his godly character was very wise, and he waited for God to move in the hearts of the people of Israel to accept him. David was committed to doing what was right and never consented to anything else. Even when the action of others would have promoted him, he was, de he was dedicated to leading Israel in righteousness. What a reflection of God's character. And that's what Christ would have us to do, reflect his character in every aspect of our living. As we begin to look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 4, it encompasses verses 1 through 12. And I've entitled this chapter, A King's Establishes of Judgment or Justice. We see in the first uh, few verses, verses 1 through 3, Ishbosheth's inability to lead. Read with me if you have, have your Bibles, starting with chapter 4, verses 1. And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of the one was Bani, and the other was Rechab, the son of Remon, a Berothite of the children of Benjamin, for Beroth also reckoned to Benjamin. And the Berothites fled to Gidom and were sojourners there unto this day. After Abner's death, 
Ishbosheth lost his courage and all Israel with him. Now, they were faced with a dilemma. They were facing two enemies. They were facing the Philistines on one hand, and then they were facing in a civil war, David and uh, Judah, the alliance behind David. Uh, so they were sort of like in a vacuum with no one to fill it. Ishbosheth had other commanders. He had Banna and Rechab, who were Benjaminites, who should have been loyal to Ishbosheth, but in reality, they were treacherous scandals who would soon betray him. In verse 4, we read about the only other heir that could have possibly have taken Ishbosheth's place. And that's Jonathan's, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. Look with me in verse 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan, and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is probably around 15, 16 years old at this time. This is about 10 years after, uh, after Saul and Jonathan have, have, have been uh, killed at war. But anyhow, Mephibosheth, even though he was Jonathan's son, would not be qualified for the throne because he was crippled. We learn more about Mephibosheth later on as, uh, as we study uh, 2 Samuel. Now, verses 5 through 12 encompass the treachery of Rechab and Banana. So let's, let's look at those scriptures. And the son of Remon, the Beeroth, Rechab and Banana, went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay on a bed at noon. And they came thither into the midst of the house as though they would have fetched wheat. And they smote him under the fifth rib, and Rechab, and Benani, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he lay on his bed, his bedchambers, and they smote him and slew him and beheaded him and took his head and got them away the plain all night and through the plain all night. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to, Hep to Hebron and said to the king, Behold the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, by an enemy which sought thy life, and the Lord hath avenged my lord the king this day of Saul and of his seed. David answered Rechab and Benoni, his brother, the sons of Remon, the Beorite, and said unto them, As the Lord lives, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversary, when one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziglag. He thought, he thought, thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. How much more than wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed. Shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they slew them and cut off their hands and their feet and hanged them up over the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried him in the sculptor of Abner in Hebron. Rechab and Banani thought that they uh, would earn a reward motion from David if they killed Ishbosheth. But just like the uh, Amalite who uh, brought David news about Saul's death, they were very wrong. David saw the treachery as an act of betrayal and a, an act of murder. At the king's command, his guards uh, killed the two because they had openly confessed that they had murdered him. They cut off their hands, they cut off their feet, and hung their corpse up as evidence of the king's justice. justice. He was displaying that he was not going to tolerate any more of this. And it was sort of like sending a signal to all those who viewed their corpse like, you know, so be it to you if you do something like this, if you're unjust. He took the mutilated... Uh, he took the, the head of, of Ishbosheth and he buried it in Hebron in the sculpture of Abner because they were relatives. That brings us to chapter 5. Uh, 
And the first part of chapter 5 is David is crowned king over all Israel. And we're going to be looking at uh, 2 Samuel verses 1 through 5. But before we get into the scriptures, you think for a minute, what a remarkable and varied life David had lived. He was a shepherd. He killed a lion and a bear. And, and God had used these events in his life, these victories, to prepare him for, for one battle after another. Uh, how would he have ever known that he could have faced Goliath unless he, unless he had known that he could trust God with a bear and a lion? David served after he killed Goliath. He served as attendant to King Saul. And uh, there he, he and Jonathan became beloved friends, very close. And uh, perhaps for 10 years, David was a fugitive, fleeing, as, fleeing from uh, Saul as an exile as an exile in the wilderness of Judea, hiding from, hiding from Saul and learning how to trust and depend upon the Lord day by day. But think about David. Uh, we read the scriptures and we think, you know, it's just a very short time. But you think about David, this was 10 years. 10 years, he had to put his trust and faith in God. He had to be patient. You know, think about some of the things that we go through in our daily life. God may be uh, tempering us, building strength in us as we learn how to wait upon him. To He brings about his will in our life. God had made David a promise. And that promise was that he was going to inherit the kingdom, not just part of the kingdom. And friends, that's a lesson that we need to learn is when God makes a promise, he just doesn't give part of his promise. Yes, he may give a part now and a part later, but he fulfills his promise. And uh, we need to, to trust God that he's going to bring it about. David trusted God in some of the most difficult circumstances. And David inherited a divided people. But with God's help, he united them and built Israel into a strong and powerful kingdom. This chapter we're about to get into describes the beginning steps David took to unite and strengthen the nation of Israel. Let's look in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spoke, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in times past, when Saul was king over us, thou was he that leadest out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be captain over Israel. It didn't take long for the tribes of Israel to conclude that David was the man, that he was the person to fill the, the need of competent leadership that they needed so desperately at this time. So representatives from each of the tribes came to David at Hebron, and uh, they, they wanted to express to him their acceptance of him. Now, the qualifications of Israel's kings were written in the law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. And the first and most important requirement that, that he was to be chosen by the Lord from the people of Israel, a king whom the Lord has chosen. And the people knew, the leaders knew, that Samuel had anointed David king some 20 years before, and it was God's will that David ascend to the throne. Also in times past, when Saul was king over them, they, they mentioned that, that it was he that led them out, that brought them in. Uh, it was he who, uh, who was a champion in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be captain over Israel. The nation needed a shepherd, and David was that shepherd. Saul had been the people's choice. He had been the people's king. But he wasn't the Lord's first choice, for God had given him had given him as a judgment against Israel because they wanted to be like all the other nations around them. The Lord loved his people, and he knew what they needed. And so he gave them a shepherd, shepherd after his own heart. 
So in the meantime, though all that David was going through while Saul was king, God was equipping David to be their king. Unlike any king that they'd ever have after him or before him. Saul was a Benjaminite. David was from the royal tribe of Judah and was born and raised in Bethlehem. Because of this, he was able to establish the dynasty that brought the Messiah, Jesus Christ, into the world because he too would be born in Bethlehem. David made a covenant with the elders of Israel. Look at the following verses. Starting in verse 3. So the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. The foundation of the Jewish nation was God's covenant with his people, as expressed in the law of Moses, especially Deuteronomy chapters 27 through 30, and, Levit and Leviticus chapter 26. If the king and the people obeyed God's will, he would bless and take care of them. But if they disobeyed and worshipped false gods, he would discipline them. Each new king that Israel had was required to affirm the supremacy of the authority of God's law. He was also required to make a promise to obey, to obey it. And uh, he was even made copies for his own personal use. David entered into a covenant with the Lord and the people, agreeing to uphold and obey God's law and to rule in the fear of the Lord. When David was a teenager, Samuel had anointed him privately. But now, the elders of the tribe of Judah anointed him when he became their king at 30 years of age. But now the elders of the whole nation anointed David and proclaimed him as their king. David was not an amateur. All the things that God had put David through made him a seasoned warrior and a gifted leader who obviously had the blessing of the Lord on his life and on his ministry. After experiencing years of turbulence and division, the nation at last had a king who was God's choice and also the people's choice. God takes time to prepare his leaders. That brings us now to, to verses 6 through 12. David establishes a new capital. Look at verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem and to the Jebusites and the inhabitants of the land which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. David, David cannot come in hither. Now, unless David took the stronghold of Zion, the same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever goeth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind, then the blind that are, that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come to the house. So David dwelt in the fort, and called the city of David, and called the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord of, of Hor, host was with him. We see where David captures uh, Jerusalem in verses 6 and 9. No, it cannot be overstated how important this move was for David. Evidently, this was God's choice. Jerusalem is not just a a temporal earthly city, but Jerusalem is an eternal city with eternal spiritual significance. This is the city that Jesus Christ would be crucified in. This city, which will one day be made new, will become the capital of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we notice that, that a certain tribe of people are mentioned there, the Jebusites. They were a people of Canaanite descent. Since the uh, earlier, earlier inhabitants of Jerusalem were Ammonites, it seems that the Jebusites took control of Jerusalem after the time of the Israelite conquest. The city had uh, earlier been conquered by Judah, but they were not able or they were not successful 
and permanently dislodging the Jebusites. That is, until David, the blind and the lame. That uh, This was sort of like, a, like a, a phrase to mock David. In other words, they felt so secure in their city that, that they thought it was impregnable, that David did not have a chance that this city could be defended by the lame and the blind. And so they taunted the Israelites and mocked the power of David by boasting that the blind and the lame could defend Jerusalem against him because of its location on a high ridge above sheer cliffs. It was considered impregnable. Now, that word Zion, this is the first time that it's used. The meaning of this name is unknown. Perhaps it was uh, the Jebusite term for the citadel located in the walls there of Jerusalem. But uh, you'll hear this name continuously throughout the scriptures. That brings us now to uh, verses 10 through 16, where we see God's blessings on David's kingdom. Read with me verses 10 and following. David went on and grew great. The Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David in house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. And there was yet sons and daughters born to David. And there be the and these be the names of those that were born into him in Jerusalem. Shema, Shobad, Nathan, and Solomon, Abar, also Elishua, and Nephag, and Japhi, and Elishama, and Elishada, and Elaphalet. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines come up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hole. God's blessing could be seen uh, in God's presence with David in verse 10. David uh, had the confidence of God's blessing upon him, and uh, as David walked before people, honorably before the Lord, it drew more respect and more honor to him. But we also see God's blessing could be seen in the gifts to him by other kingdoms. Now, it's not just about uh, God's own people recognizing God's blessing on God's man. It's about other people also. They were taking consideration uh, what was taking place. Uh, many of them heard the fame of David. And uh, so... One in particular, particular is uh, the king of Haran. Uh, look at the gifts that, that, he, that he sent him. The main effort or the main effect of, of, of this gifts was to deepen David's conviction that the Lord had established him as king over Israel. David also recognized that God had a greater purpose in blessing him because God did it not just for David's sake, but for the sake of Israel. David had been blessed so that he, in turn, could be a blessing to his nation. You know, as God's church, we need to understand that we need to be blessing to God's people and also his community, which God has placed us in. We do not exist just for ourselves. David knew that he had a special calling on his life. And David understood that it was God's hand upon him, that it was God that was bringing him all these blessings. And, God, and David understood because of that, God would make him the capable leader that the nation of Israel needed, that they so desperately needed. David was fulfilling God's plan for God's people. David is also blessed with a large family. We read that in verses 13 to 16. And after David is established in Jerusalem, the writer lists 12 additional sons as well as daughters. And notice the daughters are not mentioned, but uh, he had other daughters as well uh, mentioned to the uh, six sons born to him 
in, he in Hebron. That brings us now to verse 17 through 25, the last part of the uh, chapter where David begins to face a familiar foe. Let's read the scriptures together, beginning once again with verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hole. The Philistines also came up and spread themselves in the valley of Raphim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines, but thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Bala Perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Bala Perizism. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephidim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of, of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shalt the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him and smote the Philistines from Giba until there cometh the, the Gezer. David is going to face a familiar foe. David was the enemy of the Philistines. When David was king over Judah, the Philistines probably considered him an, an ally because of his stay in Gath and his civil war between Israel. But now David is anointed king over all Israel. And they come to a realization that uh, this is their enemy. David does not face them basically on their terms as Saul did. But David goes and depends on the Lord. And the Lord directs him how to fight this war. We need to stop and understand the battles that we're facing in our life are not our battles. They're the Lord's. And sometimes if, if we just go to God, the things that we face in life, uh, the, the challenges that we face in life could be won so much easier if we just trust God in and through them. That's what David learned how to do. Uh, the, no doubt, the Philistines' army was, was intimidating to Israel's army. They, they were much larger than uh, Israel's army. But David didn't, did not face them on, on their terms. He depends on the Lord to give him the victory. Now, the magnitude of Israel's ver victory in the first battle can be seen in the fact that the Philistines abandoned their idols on the battleground. No doubt they were the same idols that they carried in the war against Saul. And they probably thought that it was those idols that gave them the power to have the victory over Israel. But God showed them that that was not the case. They began to understand that God's blessing and God's power was now on Israel like it had been in the first battle with, with Saul. And uh, we see God's war plan. He, he doesn't always use the same strategy, uh, at always the same. Uh, we see... Uh, the ally of Rephidim, they, uh, the, uh, the ally of Rephidim, they, they placed the, the Philistines in a strategic location that enabled them uh, to uh, easily muster an attack against David and his foes there in Jerusalem. We see uh, as they're in the valley of, of Rephidim that David goes and inquires of the Lord. The Lord assures David of victory and gives him instruction not to face them head on, but to encircle around behind the Philistines and come under a, a group of balsam trees and to wait there till God gives him the command. And so God had specifically told David, wait there till you hear the troops are marching. Uh, did, you know, the question is, uh, sometimes my question is, is was it only David and his men that heard 
heard this troop marching? Or was it the Philistines that also heard this troop marching that probably brought great fear into the hearts? Well, the, the sound, no doubt, if they could hear it, would be interpreted by the Philistines as a supernatural force advancing the half of Israel, and it would strike fear in their hearts. And uh, the, the battle is seen won by David all the way from Gibeon to Gezerah. That's a distance of more than 20 miles. For 20 miles, that war raged as David men overtook the Philistines. There are a couple of things that we uh, want to pay attention here to for here before we uh, before we end this study. First of all, unlike Saul, God established David because of his obedience to God's instruction. David was very meticulous in obeying God, especially when he first became king as Israel. He wasn't about to to throw his own efforts in and mess everything up. That's what Saul did. David had learned his lesson from from uh, mistakes Saul had made, and uh, so he was uh, he was going to be obedient to God in all of God's instructions. The second thing is this: God honors those who honor Him by their trust and obe obedience. Proverbs sixteen seven says this: When a man's ways please the Lord, He maketh even his enemies to be at peace with Him. God establishes David. As king. Before God, before David become king, uh, not all the people were well behind David. But now as they saw God's hand upon David, they welcomed him as a king. And they followed him. And God wrought many victories for the nation of Israel. Do you, does your ways honor God? Honor God and God will honor you. Thank you for joining us in this podcast. Join us next week again as we continue our study in 2 Samuel. God bless you.